Welcome to Choice Classic Radio. Like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and help keep this show alive by donating at choiceclassicradio.com. For more of your favorite old-time radio shows, join us on our companion podcast, Choice Classic Radio Detectives, where we bring to you tales from the greatest detective shows the golden age of radio had to offer. And now, with 126 episodes made, broadcast on NBC Radio from 1955 to 1958, we bring to you X-1. In just a moment, X-1. But first... Once again, NBC Bandstand brings you some of the nation's top name bands in person. This week, Ralph Flanagan fills your weekday mornings with his wonderful hit tunes. Slow numbers are fast. There's no mistaking the delightful Flanagan style. And then, Art Mooney and his orchestra are also on hand with plenty of lively and rhythmic arrangements. The four lads take the Mr. Music spot this week, and Bert Parks is back as permanent MC. Hear them all on NBC Bandstand. Now stay tuned for X-1 on NBC. Countdown for blastoff. X-5, 4, 3, 2, X-1, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents X minus one. Tonight, Surface Tension by James Blish. Come in, Professor. Come in. Mr. President, do sit down. I'm terribly sorry to have kept you waiting. Time has very little significance, sir. Well, now, uh, what is the urgent nature of your visit? Mr. President, for some time now at the Nuclear Institute... A group of us have been making a study of a new star, which has entered our constellation. Yes, the military advised me there was some disturbance. We've completed our calculation, sir. And? Before I give you our results, let me tell you that we've been in touch with the Scientific Council of the Asian Confederation. They've verified the results. I'm waiting, Professor. Mr. President, the effect of this new star in our galaxy will be extremely catastrophic. At the rate it's expanding, it will cause the sun to explode. The what? The sun is going to explode. But well, that means... Exactly. The world will end in precisely two weeks and seven hours. This is incredible. Are you absolutely certain of these calculations? Absolutely. Does anyone know of this? Well, as soon as we guessed where our study was leading us, we classified all information... The actual final results are known only to a small group of scientists here and in the Asian Confederation. Two weeks. And seven hours. That would be September 4th, 2056. At approximately 12 noon. Is there anything to be done? Nothing. The other planets, Mars, Venus... All will be destroyed. The universe as we know it will disintegrate. And the race will vanish. It's, it's impossible. Those are the facts, Mr. President. How you choose to make them public, if you do choose to make them public, is a matter of government. Yes, yes, of course. Uh, has the president of the Asian Confederation been notified? He's being notified at this moment. Hmm. I intend to take the following steps, Professor. First, I will contact the Asian Confederation. Uh, what's the name of their chief scientist? Uh... Dr. Gorlick. Ah, yes. I'll propose that you and Dr. Gorlick be given every resource to find a method of preserving the race. 
You'll be flown to their laboratories by rocket ship in an hour. I would like to spend these remaining days with my family. Your family can accompany you. They'll ask questions. They should know better by now. You will not release the information to the public. I would prefer to keep it a complete secret, provided the Asians agree, of course. A public announcement would only create utter panic and chaos. I assume it will happen instantaneously? Yes, instantaneously. Mm. Then secrecy is best. Oh, one thing, Mr. President. Yes? I wonder if perhaps religious leaders should be told. Professor, I believe in the power of God myself. I also believe that my single prayer can be heard by the Almighty just as well as if there were ten million. There will at least be two of us, Mr. President. I, too, will pray. Dr. Gorlick. Professor, how nice to meet you again. Do sit down, sit down. Thank you. Quite a problem, eh? It's quite a problem. If the rest of the world knew what we too know. I feel they should be informed, nevertheless. Well, that part of it is for the administrators. We have our own world. Do you seriously believe that we have the remotest chance of solving this problem in the two weeks that remain for the universe to exist? That depends on what you consider a solution, Professor. Anything that will preserve the race. In that case, we have a solution. You're joking. About so serious a matter? Hardly. But would you step over to the table, please? Now, if you will be so good, uh, look into that eyepiece in front of you while I focus it. Will you tell me, please, what you see there? Fascinating. Most unusual. Would you be good enough to describe it? Yes, of course. I, I see what... Looks like a section of a large swimming pool. Plant life. They're very tiny, and uh, some kind of animal life, almost molecular in size. Good. Now let me change the magnification. Possible. Go on, please. Describe. What? I see what looks like dogs, cats, a cow. Oh, evidently swimming underwater in this medium. W- wait. Yes, they, they seem to be dogs and cows and cats, except that they appear to have a uh, gill-like breathing apparatus. Good, good. It looks as if somehow these species have been mutated to live underwater. Exactly, exactly. Well, I, uh, I don't understand how this is possible. It would take hundreds of generations, thousands of years possibly, to affect such a change. Even with modern genetic control. Ah, that is the key, Professor. Let me ask you another question. Yes? Would you estimate the size of these creatures? I would say they're normal size. And the size of the pool, as you call it? Uh, A tank of quite enormous size. I, I cannot see the walls, but I assume they are there. Good. Now, Professor, prepare yourself for a shock. I've been a scientist too long to shock easily, Dr. Gorley. Nonetheless, you will be shocked to learn that what you have just been looking into is a single microscopic drop of water, less than a milligram. A single drop of water? Yes. Those dogs and cats are microscopic? Submicroscopic, smaller than a filterable virus. This is incredible, Doctor. Incredible, perhaps, but we have done it. Ah. We found a way to reduce the size of the original fertilized eggs through bombardment of the molecules. In this way, we can produce a full-size dog that is infinitesimal. And you believe this will help us solve our problem? I am convinced of it. What do you propose? This is our plan. We will create submicroscopic humans. At the submicroscopic level, a thousand generations can reproduce in the equivalent of a few seconds of time. In less than an hour, we can have a species of human that is capable of living underwater. Gill breathers? Precisely. 
And then what? Don't you see, my friend? In a single drop of water, we can reproduce as many human beings as now live in the city of uh, uh, New Chicago or Trans-Europa. But when the sun explodes in two weeks' time, all life, even that in a single drop of water, must perish. That is true, Professor. But remember this. To a submicroscopic species of human, two weeks would be the equivalent of some 20 million years on Earth. In other words, to these human beings, starting tomorrow, the species will have hundreds of thousands of generations, each living a full life, before the final explosion of the universe. Almost like playing God. I am not a subscriber to the concept of God, Professor. I must say I'm slightly shocked to discover that you, a man of science... Believes in a creator? I do, Doctor. In any event, will you help us go ahead with our experiment? I have no choice. Good. We'll begin tonight to produce the first species. Careful with the virus. Here's the tube. Now then, we'll place this in a drop of water underneath the lens of the microscope. What about the evaporation and condensation of the drop? All outside factors will be controlled. Temperature, humidity, and so on. Will you turn on the lens, please? Now, using the highest magnification, we'll be able actually to manipulate a single being with electron magnets. A sensation we would interpret, possibly, as we interpret a centrifugal force. Ready? Ready. Good. We begin the experiment. Time? 1900 hours, 56 minutes, 3 seconds. Coming up on point four, three, two, one, zero. Observation. The first fertilized ovum, reduced to submicroscopic size, has begun to develop. Time. 1956, 20 seconds. Coming up on two, one, zero. Four submicroscopic human beings have been reproduced. Two appear to be males, two females. Time? 1956, 24. Observation. Ten generations of submicroscopic humans have been reproduced. Web toes and fingers and elementary gill modifications have begun in response to submersion of species in highly oxygenated vapor. Time? 1956, 45. 100 generations have reproduced. Increased water in vapor has resulted in gill structure, species now ready for total submersion in a droplet of water. Turn on the electron magnet. Now for the crucial part of the experiment. Total submersion. Then it should die. I feel like a murderer. The prolongation of the human race is at stake. It's a calculated risk. Still... Steady. I am about to affect the transfer. Steady. Now. Done. Look in the microscope quickly. I can't find them. Let me. Ah, they're alive and swimming around. How many? Thousands. We've done it, Professor. Inside that drop of water, human beings like you and me, except for their gills, are already beginning to establish a civilization that will last for them... Millions of years. And for us. Two weeks to observe and wonder, and then... Unless a miracle should occur. Let us begin now. Time, please. 1900 hours, 56 minutes, 49 seconds, 3, 2, 1, 0. Observation. The equivalent of a million years has already passed inside our droplet of water. Human life is firmly established. Sir! Sir! Come in, Lavin! Come in! Oh, oh. 
I swam down from the museum. I'm exhausted. Rest yourself. Would you like some proto steak? No, thank you. Breath of oxygen, perhaps? 100 proof distilled from pure upper level water. A breath, perhaps. Ah. Oh. Now then, I assume that you've come about the place. Yes. Naturally, the directors of the museum are most anxious. I haven't completed the translation yet. It's been six months. Yes, I know that, but they're incomplete. One of them was evidently lost during the final battle with the eaters. Sure. Can you tell me off the record what you've already deciphered? Well, first, let me warn you. These plates were prepared thousands of generations ago. They're highly romantic. What they tell us may be fantasy. Oh, still, I'm fascinated. After all, the greatest archaeological discovery of all time buried a million years in the ooze of the bottom. Very well. The first line of the oldest plate reads as follows. It goes, In the beginning, we were created... Created? What an extraordinary concept. By whom? What about evolution? Yeah, let, let, let me finish. It goes, We were created by men who are not as we are, but who are our ancestors all the same. They were caught in some disaster, and they made us and put us here in our universe so that the race of men might live on. Ridiculous. Perhaps. Well, this supposes a universe other than ours. The theory has been advanced before. By fools. Fools. Look at us, Lavin. Are we really suited to this universe? Our gills, our webbed feet, these are the product of evolution and adaptation. But the shape of our bodies, the way we swim... Well, I'll admit there's some basis for the theory, but... Every experiment, every attempt to prove that anything exists outside, that the surface can be pierced. According to the plates, the surface can be pierced. Listen to this passage. There are three surfaces of the universe. The first is the bottom, where the water ends. The second is the thermocline, the dividing water between the bottom and the sky. The third is the surface film beyond which none can pass. And beyond the surface film, <laughs> beyond the surface is the universe of the creators. Well, the whole thing sounds like a parable or a song. Whatever it is, remember this. Thousands of generations pondered the miracle of our existence before these plates were written. Primitive. Men. You sound like a mystic, Char. To think that a scientist like yourself could believe in the existence of creators. Nonetheless, creators who were formed in our own image. Or we in theirs. I'm shocked. Truly. I intend to complete the translation of the plates. I will pursue this project for the rest of my life, if necessary. Time, Professor. Second day, 14 hours, 6 minutes, 10 seconds. Observation. The plates which were inscribed with microscopic data by an earlier generation have evidently been removed by a subsequent generation. Our study shows that a highly developed civilization is now living in the drop of water. Certain water organisms have been domesticated and underwater ships have been developed. The meeting of the council is called to order. Gentlemen, you all know the topic. Our speaker will be sure. Gentlemen, some 28 time units ago, when I was a much younger man... I was given the privilege of translating some metal plates found buried in the bottom. As all of you know, I've devoted much of my life to convincing the world that travel through the surface film was not only possible but necessary to survive. Finally, the council has seen fit to grant my request for a special ship to accomplish this travel. I'm deeply grateful. And I would like to request my friend Lavin as head engineer for this project. Permission is granted. We wish you luck. The whole of our world will be following your expedition. What's happening, Dr. Gorlick? From what I can detect, the gill breeders are preparing for the equivalent of space travel. A large cylindrical ship is being built. What method of power are they using? I can barely detect it through the microscope, but... My guess would be that they will use some form of living creatures to power the vessel. Shard a leader. Shard a leader. Leader, go ahead, Shard. The ship is ready to take off for the upper levels, leader. Water sealed in? All tight. Tie Tom's ready to move? Tie Tom's ready. We'll give you an escort of paramecium ships as far as the upper level. After that, you'll be on your own. Very good. 
Whenever you give the signal, Captain Lavin can order the dire times to proceed. The sandbar is clear for the initial climb. Your course is straight up the stem of water plant six. Dye Tom's ready? Dye Tom's ready, sir. Cilia in motion? Cilia in motion. Internal water circulators on? Circulators on. Countdown for takeoff. Five. Five. Four. Four. Three. Three. Two. Two. One. One. Zero. Dye Tom's in motion. Full speed ahead. Good luck. Well, sir, this is the beginning of your dream. If the ship holds. We've utilized every engineering principle known to man. Double construction of the toughest water lily, 2,000 living diatoms for power, 20 million so I'm not worried about the power. I'm worried about the temperature and the impact when we reach the surface film. What's our speed? 20,000 knots. Well, we've reached water plant six. Now for the climb up the stem to the surface. Overseer. Overseer. Request more mucus from diatoms. Proceed with climb up stalk six. Yes, sir. If the diatoms can hold the stalk, the reduced pressure of the surface will have hurdled the first barrier. We're at pressure six now, almost at the upper level. Captain. Yes? We've lost 27 diatoms. Ciliary detachment. Not serious. We have the vorti to fall back on. Proceed. Yes, sir. What's our pressure? Three coming into two now. We're already closer to the surface film than man has ever gone. Our unmanned test ships went through. Unmanned test ships are a different story, Lavin. Besides, if we do get through to the other side, our problems may just be starting. Oh, we're entering pressure one zone. Yeah. We're getting too much oxygen in the water. Engineer, switch to internal water supply for breathing. Lavin. What is it? The scopes, look. I can't look now. What is it? I think... Yes, I can see it. I can see the surface film. Describe it. A great black whirling mass. Huge boulders and asteroids being whirled and ground back and forth like some tremendous boiling mass of mud and stone. It isn't too late to turn back. No, the ship was built to go through the film. If we fail, at least we can die knowing we tried. Very well, sir. Overseer, order all diatoms. Full speed ahead. Full speed ahead. Full speed ahead. <laughs> Film, Char. Pressure on the ship is increasing. Overseer, more oxygen for the diatoms. Captain, the diatoms are dying. More oxygen. Keep moving. We're almost through. Char, use the auxiliary vortai. Maybe the motion of their cilia and the thrust of the water. Overseer, bring up the vortai. Full speed ahead. We're, we're moving. We're making headway. Oh, the ship will only hold together. Char, we're through. We're on the surface. Open the viewing port. It's blinding. Put on your eye shield. Look. Look, Char. Like a huge sheet of metal stretching as far as the eye can see. With thousands of small streams and great rivers of water. Look above us, Lavin. Space. Space as far as one can see. And a single huge sun like a great eye looking down at us. Must be billions of miles above us. See those enormous boulders and that molten rock on the surface. The ancients did not lie when they made the plates, Lavin. The universe does exist beyond the surface. Yes, but where are your creators, sure? Certainly, they were a romantic notion. I believe they exist, Lavin. Char! I... Captain! Captain, the diatoms are dying. There's not enough oxygen in the water cases. What's the atmosphere like? Almost 30% oxygen. Completely unbreathable. We'll have to try to get back into the surface film to restore life to the diatoms. Overseer, get the diatoms out of their shells. Full reverse speed down the stalk. We're going under again. Yes, sir. I'll try. We know one thing, Lavin. The surface can sustain life. Can't sustain ours much longer. Full reverse. It's no use, Captain. The diatoms are near death. Use the vortai. We haven't enough water, sir. They're starting to suffocate. We've got to get back beneath the surface. Lavin, we must. Think of what it means to mankind to know that the universe goes on, that it can sustain life. I don't know what to do, Shaw. We're finished. There must be a way. A way? Why don't you pray to your creators now? Perhaps they'll help you. And that's for me. I'm resigned to death. I cannot share your bitterness, Lavin. We have enough water for perhaps two minutes breathing, Shaw. There are no miracles and no creators. You'd better prepare to die. I am as ready as you, Lavin. Captain, Captain, we're strangling. Well, sir, why don't you pray to the creators? Better still, let me. I have a louder voice. Hey, creators, you all-powerful ones who made us, can you hear me? This is Captain Lavin of the first ship to breach the surface. We need your help. Can you hear me? We need your help. If there be creators, and I believe there are, And I ask that our presence be noted and that we be delivered from this trial not for ourselves, but for the good of the race. Well, Doctor, 
The ship has emerged from the film and is lying on the surface. There is no movement now. Probably strangling from lack of water. Very likely. What are you going to do? It's a pity they can't get back again. Eventually, they may have to learn to live on the surface when the temperature changes. Why not help them? You've played God before. Why not, indeed? Switch on the electron magnet. Ready. Now then, if I can just breach the surface tension near them, they'll be sucked under again, as in a whirlpool. If they survive... You'd better hurry. Here goes. Can't live much longer, Sean. No. It's getting... What? What's that? I don't know. We're moving. Downward. Flavin, it's a vortex. A vortex is opening through the surface. One way or another, we'll die. The ship can't take the stress. We're dropping. Sean! The water is circulating again. It's, it's too much to believe, Char. It, it's like... A miracle. Yes. It is a miracle. Well, Doctor? They've gotten through. The ship is floating down toward the bottom now. I wonder what they thought at the moment they were saved. It must have seemed to them as if the hand of God reached out to help them. Very likely. Do you suppose they prayed? To whom would they pray? I don't know. Perhaps to us, to the creators. It is not inconceivable. If only the human race, as, as we know it, had creators who could reach down and save us from destruction. How do you know we don't? Professor... I'm a scientist. So am I, Doctor. Those submicroscopic humans can't see us because we're too big to see. A molecule of our flesh would be like a world to them. And yet, we exist. We cannot hear their individual voices, perhaps, but we are capable of intervention of a sort. Is it not conceivable that our own plight might not be seen and recognized? What else is there at this time but to admit our inadequacy and to cast off this arrogance that gives us bitter pride instead of humility? Where are you going, Professor? To pray, Doctor. There isn't much time. Professor. Yes? Wait. I will come with you. You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, which this month features Jackpot by Clifford D. Simak. After years of searching, they had discovered the richest strike in the whole galaxy. But what in the name of space was it? Galaxy Magazine, on your newsstand today. Tonight, by transcription, X-1 has brought you Surface Tension, a story from the pages of Galaxy written by James Blish, and adapted for radio by George Lefferts. Featured in the cast were Louis Van Ruten, Danny Ocko, Lawson Zerby, Larry Haynes, Mason Adams, James Stevens, and Robert Hastings. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Scott Buckley and is an NBC Radio Network production. That concludes today's episode. We'd like to thank you and remind you to donate at choiceclassicradio.com. Remember, your donations make episodes like this possible.